Welcome to Deloitte Debrief's tax webcast series in the Asia Pacific region. Today's webcast is from our transfer pricing series titled Treasury Transfer Pricing. Our focus today would be mainly on debt pricing, cash pooling structures, and other related areas that the treasury teams of multinationals should be aware of. My name is Trina Maitra, a tax director based in Deloitte, India. I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. I have six Deloitte experts with me today. Let me introduce them to you. We have Priscilla Ratilal. Pris is a partner in the Deloitte Australia transfer pricing team. Pris has over 17 years of experience across Sydney, New York, and London. When based in New York, Pris had in-house experience in a diversified financial services group, managing transfer pricing for the Americas region. We then have Philip, Philip Morali. Philip is a director in the transfer pricing team at Deloitte Hong Kong. He has 11 years experience working in Hong Kong and London and specialized in providing transfer pricing services to clients in the financial service sector. We also have Michael Sun. Michael has over 12 years of experience in Deloitte Global and China transfer pricing teams. Michael has served a number of multinational in areas of outbound China TP planning, frontline TP and China tax advisory and various other TP matters. Michael also co-leads the financial transaction transfer pricing team in mainland China. From Southeast Asia, we have Rishang and Thapian Ki. Rishang is a partner in transfer pricing service of Deloitte Southeast Asia, co-based in Philippines and Malaysia. He has more than 13 years of experience in dealing with some of the largest multinational corporations around the world. While he has an extensive transfer pricing experience in diverse industry, his forte and interest lies in managing financial services and financial transactions. Tape is a senior manager in a Deloitte Singapore office. He has immense experience and focus on the financial transaction and services space in Singapore. He has been in, you know, involved in many such cash pool and loan analysis for multinationals. We also have Anushri Jagnani, an executive director from our India office, who has more than a decade experience in financial services, specializing in banks and other sectors. She also has in tremendous experience in dealing with financial transaction litigation in India. Before we start, just a few factors that we should all be remembering. You know, first of all, all users now are in listen only mode. If you have any content related questions, you can submit them at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the screen. We will do our best to respond to your questions during the presentation. Second, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at their convenience during the webcast. You may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen if you want to download today's slide and related publications. Please go to the downloads and links box. On the other hand, mobile users can view the slides and answer the survey on screen. Thirdly, if you require an attendance record for this event, you will receive an automated email with a CPE certificate after watching for 50 minutes. Well, let's get started. In recent years, Treasury transfer pricing has experienced a notable surge in significance. The introduction of OECD Chapter 10 has prompted many countries to reinvigorate their efforts in fortifying the scrutiny of financial transactions. In the Asia-Pacific region, Treasury departments have encountered substantial challenges adapting to these evolving trends and intricacies. Furthermore, the heightened attention on these transactions has amplified the documentation requirements and necessitated vigilance to evaluate such financial dealings properly. With this backdrop, I would like to invite Chris. Chris, Australia had a robust FTTP valuation mechanism always. In fact, in my mind, I think some of the principles we observed in you know, the landmark case studies in Australia later significantly shaped the principles that we find in the OECD Chapter 10. 
Have you noticed any notable shifts, changes, or even developments in this context? Thanks, Trina. And I think it's definitely worth noting that all of the recent transfer pricing cases that have been decided in the ATO's favor um, in recent times were all financing cases, so namely Chevron and Singtel. And, and to answer your question, Trina, I think it is safe to say that the outcomes in these cases have um, definitely emboldened not just the ATO, but also tax authorities around the world. Um, so maybe taking a look at Chevron um, first, the court had regard to the treasury policies and practices of the multinational group, including the granting of a parental guarantee to a group entity that raised um, funds at a lower rate than the rate at which the particular funds in question were on length. And as a result of that um, judgment, um, really the case now stands for the principle that multinational enterprises would always at arm's length raise funds at the lowest co um, cost possible. Um, Australia has long been described as a BEPS enthusiast and um, its adoption of the principles of passive association that's now enshrined in Chapter 1 of the OECD Transfer Pricing Guidelines actually predated the issuance of those guidelines in 2017. Um, passive association is the notion that a subsidiary um, enjoys a higher credit rating that it might otherwise have on a standalone basis due to its affiliation with the multinational group and that this higher credit rating should be considered at arm's length. In Chevron, um, the Australian court arguably went further than um, the principles of passive association and indicated that um, really an intercompany guarantee would have been provided to reduce Chevron's cost of funding. So not just relying on the principles of passive association and implicit support, but actually stating that explicit support would have been given at arm's length. And the commerciality of really raising um, funds at the lowest possible um, cost, you know, begs another question, and that is, you know, would collateral have been offered to reduce borrowing costs, particularly if the um, borrower in question for the intercompany loan has um, unencumbered assets to offer up as collateral? Um, within this debriefs, it's not possible to delve into all of the factors that could impact the pricing of an intercompany loan, such as the tenor of the loan, the currency of the loan, the use of fixed versus floating rates. Um, I think it's also safe to say that, um, at least in Australia, there'll be a lot more scrutiny on the arm's length nature of the quantum of the loan under proposed changes to Australia's thin capitalization rules, which will then impact the credit score of the loan and ultimately the pricing of the loan. And so suffice to say that there is um, increased focus on arm's length behavior between the parties and all terms of the intercompany loans and not just the interest rate. Um, there's also the need for commercial rationale when entering into and amending intercompany loan agreements. And this has been particularly pertinent and highlighted in the Singtel um, case as well. So back, back, back to you, Trina. That's, that's really very insightful and yeah, quite practical uh, to even relate with it. Uh, but bearing these developments in mind, uh, what would be your advice uh, that you would like to, you know, provide to clients? Um, I would say that um, I think what came out through the judgments was that while while there's a lot of scrutiny by the ATO and also by the courts um, on the external benchmarks used in both um, the Chevron and the Singtel um, cases, it is worth noting that the internal treasury policies and the funding practices of the multinational groups, as, as mentioned earlier, were really highly determinative um, in the outcomes of the cases. And so we'd certainly advise clients to review their in-house treasury and funding policies and consider whether if those policies were to be applied to their intercompany loans, you know, would it result in different terms or different outcomes? And we are certainly seeing in practice um, the tax function getting involved a lot earlier um, in the establishment of intercompany arrangements and actively um, interacting with Treasury uh, colleagues early on in, de in determining the terms of those intercompany loans. Thanks, thanks, Chris. I think that was really insightful. With that, uh, we now have our first polling question. As we can see on screen, we would like to understand what is your organization's most significant challenge in managing financial transaction transfer pricing in the current regulatory and economic landscape? And we will have one minute for you to answer this. Wow, we can see a lot of people really answering. And as of now, I think managing increased document 
adaptation requirement is surely one of the pain points. Great. I think with that, uh, you know, it's it's also good to see that uh, there is no clear. Uh, isn't there is a majority compliance with evolving transfer pricing regulation, but it, it's all mixed. So people are indeed finding a lot of things uh, challenging in this phase. With that, we also want to understand a few more things. For example, in the APAC region, one big challenge of treasury entities are cash pooling effective, pooling cash effectively, you know, either through loans or cash pooling mechanism. In many countries, they have managed domestic requirements and they also have to see the cross-border issues. Such arrangements are very commonly observed in China and Hong Kong. So I'd like to invite Michael. Michael, would you be able to walk us through what are the recent developments in China and what the treasury companies in China should be aware of. Thank you, Trina, and very happy uh, to answer this point. But first of all, I would say that China has established a quite comprehensive foreign exchange regulatory system to manage cross-border intercompany loans and cash pools under capital accounts. So often as a threshold question, the quota control system on cross-border loan is something that m and treasury as well as tax teams should be familiar with. Traditionally, the quota on inbound China loan can be determined simply by the difference between the total investment and registered capital of the local company. Companies in China may now opt for a new loan balance and the quota approach, which is a standardized formula. I won't jump into any formula here, but basically a company's net asset and a set of predefined variables that covers tenor, loan category, foreign exchange indication, etc., would be considered as well as a quote-unquote macroprudential parameter set and adjusted centrally by China's foreign exchange authority. Now, in terms of tax considerations, the 6% China VAT on financial interest will be a cost item given such that uh, being not deductible. That's, however, now something worth watching out as China STA reviews and updates the VAT rules. Stamp duty shall be levied where there's a loan agreement with a bank or so but something worth confirming locally for a particular cash pool structure. Withholding tax is another critical tax item often reviewed at the stage of structuring a loan or cash pool. And when it comes to interest deduction, China clearly adopts a standard relief party debt to equity ratio approach being the think capitalization rule. Interest deduction over and above the prescribed D2E ratio, say two to one for non-financial sector taxpayers would trigger a ThinkCap, uh, ThinkCap special matter report in order to support full interest deduction. Although China STA hasn't specifically revised transfer pricing rules to respond to Chapter 10 of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines updated in 2020, the current China TP rules do cover filing and also analysis of financial transactions. Mention the common use of comparable uncontrolled price or cut method for financial transactions and the require an arm's length pricing that I think in practice is sometimes oversimplified by referring to central policy rate without actually delineating the key transaction terms and market comparables. And also, as Pris said earlier, the commerciality of raising funds at the pos lowest possible cost should never be ignored for transfer pricing. Since uh, 2022, central banks in most of the rich countries have been raising the interest rate to tank global inflation. China's central bank or PBOC is, however, moving the other way around and has recently uh, cut the interest rate, although mildly, but for a few times in a row now, for purpose of recovering China's economy. So as a result, there has been a widened interest rate gap between RMB and the main global currencies. Looking at the chart on this slide, the LPR being China's policy rate is now just below 3.5% compared with 5% plus for the US and UK and 4% plus for Australia. The yield curve of corporate bonds could be showing the difference even greater. So under this context, we've seen quite some m and starting to revisit the pricing of their previous cross-border loans and cash pool in China, such as refinancing or adjusting the interest rate 
on their inbound China loans, as well as revisiting the overall cash flow strategy. Tax and transfer pricing specialists are often involved in these initiatives to manage interest deduction and transfer pricing risk as the m and capture the lower cost of fund in China. One of the key aspects for transfer pricing in doing debt pricing in China is that um, for China, it has its own very different credit rating environment that can be showcased by the rating distribution of issuers in corporate bond market. So in some cases, credit worthiness analysis has to be performed and reviewed from a local perspective. All these are under greater interest of China STA as, chi uh, as the tax authorities in China become more ex experienced and also look to strengthen transfer pricing supervision in areas that grow more extensive than before. So Trina, I would say in my uh, observation, financial transaction could be one of the next potential areas that China STA could look at and get to its own point of view with reference to the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. Wow, uh, that's very interesting to know. And uh, that reaffirms what we have been trying to say, you know, the focus of all tax authorities on these type of transactions. Could you also throw some light on how multinational establish or plan to have a cross-border pooling structure in China? Means what are the guidelines, what they can be mindful of? For sure. So now let's move on to the next slide and talk a bit about cross-border cash pool structure. Um, that I think is, is now more accessible than previous for many m and in China. So by definition, a cash pool provides a couple of key benefits, particularly for m and that want to concentrate cash domestically and connect China with wider treasury strategy, mobilize cash and enhance repatriation from their successful operations in China, optimize cost of found, as we said, as, as well as set out a robust cash flow framework for go forward investment and operations in China. Cash pooling can be actually structured in different ways. The diagram at the right hand side just shows one of them, uh, whereby uh, company A being the domestic cash pool leader sets up uh, with a group of domestic related parties and concentrates RMB from local operation on a daily basis. And then company A connects with co company E being an overseas related party say in Hong Kong or in Singapore through a free trade non-resident or FTN account usually open in a free trade zone. And once the structure is set up, company A and E can sweep cash with each other on a daily basis, despite the quota control being defined when the structure is reviewed and registered. Company E could then uh, connect with other offshore accounts, potentially global cash pool or so, and convert offshore RMB into other currencies as needed and thus establish a structure that connects China with overseas. There are a couple of um, cross-border cash pool programs available in China, but with nuances and differences in criteria. But I would say in general, most of them are ease with a healthy operation in China should have a good chance to sign up for one of the programs. Now, when it comes to transfer price analysis, there are a few key aspects to analyze carefully, such as how regional or global credit rating can be used for China, and also the analysis on the setup of cash pool uh, deposit and borrowing rates. Again, using the structure on this slide, company B, C, and D are under company A, and only through company A able to sweep RMB to overseas. So for the three domestic accounts, the analysis might be performed primarily at the local level, but for cross-border transactions, Company A's play and the perspectives of, of both China and overseas tax authorities could add a layer of complication. So very likely a holistic analysis may be required. And whether the approach may be, the remuneration model of company A being the cash pool leader should be fully tested. So I think all these um, transfer pricing considerations should follow the commercial factors that really you know, drive a company's treasury strategy. And as we wrap up these considerations for China, I think uh, it's, it's just interesting to explore, you know, how the divided cost of fund, again, the lower cost in China now, and the increasing cost overseas could potentially impact a company's treasury and transfer pricing model. And I guess this is particularly relevant to places like Hong Kong and Singapore being, you know, the treasury center in the region for a lot of m &Es. So maybe let me direct this question to Philip. 
So Philip, uh, what's your take on these treasury and transfer pricing initiatives? And what are you seeing in the market from a Hong Kong perspective? Thanks, Michael. And that's a really interesting point to explore, particularly in a market like Hong Kong, where many groups have substantial treasury operations. Transfer pricing within the treasury function brings with it some unique challenges. So whether they relate to transfer pricing approaches, limitations in available data for benchmarking purposes, um, interactions with local domestic tax rules and incentives, um, the delineation of certain transactions, and also reliable methodologies for credit assessments. All of these need to be considered and overcome in order to effectively and compliantly manage your transfer pricing. So let's start today by taking a look at the two core approaches for considering your tre treasury transfer pricing arrangements. We have a profit center and a cost center approach. Depending on the approach taken, this will impact the way in which the treasury functions are characterized and the way in which they're remunerated, as well as the transfer pricing methodologies adopted. So under a profit center approach, the treasury function is treated as a profit generating unit of the group. It's essentially characterized as an in-house financial institution servicing affiliates in a similar way to that a bank would. If you compare this to a cost center approach, the treasury function would be treated as a cost bearing unit within the group. It will be characterized as a provider of more routine services focused on coordinating and optimizing internal liquidity. The use of a profit center or cost center approach will be unique and individual to each group, depending on their own treasury operations. However, in a significant number of cases, and particularly in the financial services industry, where groups are heavily regulated, the cost center approach is often applied with many tax authorities being familiar with this approach. Now moving on to the next slide, Hong Kong has some unique trends and issues when it comes to treasury transfer pricing, which relate in a lot of cases to the interaction between the Hong Kong transfer pricing rules and local domestic tax law. Hong Kong has a territorial system of taxation, which means that Hong Kong, only Hong Kong sourced income is subject to tax, and as such, the interest income on many loans issued by Hong Kong entities is deemed as offshore sourced and therefore not taxable. Interest deduction rules in Hong Kong are also important to consider, as for certain entities, there are limitations in taking interest deductions in the tax return. There's also a corporate treasury center regime in Hong Kong, set up to encourage corporates to use Hong Kong as a corporate treasury center hub, with qualifying entities able to enjoy a concessionary tax rate of 8.25%. We've seen a slow update of the corporate uptake of the corporate treasury center regime as many groups have favored continuing under existing structures which utilize the offshore claim however we think there may be a change in the tides moving forward and this in part may relate to the new foreign sourced income exemption regime which requires additional levels of substance for hong kong entities claiming income as offshore sourced now i'll throw it back to trina Thanks, Philip. Um, I think maybe I can just yeah. continue maybe technical difficulties. So um, I think Trina was going to um, going to jump in, but we can um, I can provide some insights um, a little bit more on the interaction between the transfer pricing rules and the tax rules in Hong Kong. Um, this mainly relates to the application of the transfer pricing rules, which would only um, come into effect where there is a um, potential tax advantage in Hong Kong. Um, in relation to a transaction. So therefore, it's really important for taxpayers to assess the domestic tax in Hong Kong, understand the applicability of these transfer pricing rules before moving on to assess appropriate arm's length pricing.
investors, it may actually be the case that transactions fall outside of the transfer pricing rules in Hong Kong, which can provide taxpayers with additional flexibility. <clears throat> On the next slide, we've highlighted some of the treasury transfer are having to navigate. Um, we'll focus on a couple of these areas and provide some insights through a Hong Kong transfer pricing lens on how these can be managed. First up is interest-free loans, which have long been used by groups operating in Hong Kong. Since the introduction of the transfer pricing legislation in 2018, groups have had to reassess the viability of continuing to not charge interest on their intercompany loans and whether this can be supported as arm's length. There are certain, cir certain circumstances, for example, domestic transactions, or where interest income or expenses are not taxable and or deductible and there may be no impact therefore of having interest-free loans from a Hong Kong transfer pricing perspective. However, the question remains for most intergroup financing arrangements <clears throat> as to what is an arm's length price for the funding. Based on experience and market data, particularly when you look at the wider interest trends in the global economy in 2023, it is unusual to see no charge applied for financing, and so many groups have had to or are still in the process of refining their policies. <clears throat> Intercompany balances are another common trend that we see groups needing to address under the current Hong Kong transfer pricing environment. These balances can occur under a variety of circumstances and there is no specific point in time where they're deemed as a loan under the law. However, taxpayers must be mindful that after a certain point it can be argued that there is, there is not arm's length to not charge an interest rate on an outstanding balance. Often groups can apply rationale to argue that such balances are more equity in nature. However, where this is not possible, it may be worthwhile considering building up a defense position to support the treatment applied. To wrap up, transfer pricing in relation to treasury functions in Hong Kong can be a complex area for taxpayers. And we would advise that you carefully consider your transfer pricing policies, benchmarking and documentation to ensure that you're compliant with relevant local laws. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, and that's quite comprehensive. Just a just a check. Could you hear me? Because I had faced a bit of a technical issue. Great. So now I think it's time to come to our second polling question on screen. So this is a question for all of you to again take a minute to reply. Is your treasury still evaluating financial transaction transfer pricing policies through legacy approaches? How frequently does your organization conduct a review of its treasury transfer pricing policies and strategies? So we'd request you to respond within a minute. And the responses are coming in. Okay. Again, we see, you know, there is almost, a, uh, I would say, majority is not applicable or don't know. Well, I think uh, that's something which is really things we should be evaluating. But there is almost a tie between ad hoc transfer pricing or an annual. So something that uh, it's, it's high time to really explore and deliberate upon. Well, now I will turn to Anushri. Anushri, India being one of the most litigated jurisdictions, what has been your experience? What is new in India about the treasury companies? And what should the treasury companies be mindful of? Thanks, Trina. Uh, seen from a practical relevance perspective, treasury hubs are usually located in low tax jurisdictions. Given India tax rates, cost of funds, regulatory constraints, India has generally not been a preferred destination for central treasury. Additionally, cross-border intra-group cash pooling is not allowed in India. 
in terms of the technical guidance and arms length consideration, there are no specific guidance on central treasury under Indian transfer pricing regulations. Though reference can be made to the OECD Chapter 10 guidelines regarding considerations for intergroup loans by treasury hubs to other entities. For determining the ALP, uh, you know, methods like CUP, cost of funds approach, credit default swaps, economic modeling, etc. may be applied. Taxpayers also resort to indicative interest rate quotes from independent banks, uh, though that could typically be challenged as evidence of arm's length price in case those are only quotes and there is no evidence of actual transactions being undertaken at those prices. For managing the central treasury operations in commercial banks, banks have typically set up policies for inter-branch borrowing, lending for asset liability management functions regulated by the Central Bank of India. Market borrowing such as bonds, syndicated loans are centrally managed for operational convenience. The issuing bank typically recovers the cost of funds, legal costs and other related expenses from the borrowing branch. If there are any centrally provided administrated and support services uh, in connection with these transactions, they are also recovered along with an arm's length markup. I'll also want to talk about some of the uh, some of the regulatory developments that are applicable in this section. So the International Financial Services Center in Gift City in Gujarat is India's maiden venture to set up an international financial services center uh, for developing a well diversified and globally competitive financial services center. This is an ideal location for setting up global and regional corporate treasury centers on account of the attractive tax regime, robust banking ecosystem, access to capital markets, and facilitative regulatory environment. In 2021, the authorities had also issued a framework for undertaking global and regional corporate treasury center activities by fin financial companies and financial units incorporated in the gift city. This framework will create opportunities for global and Indian corporates to develop international operations by centralizing their treasury activities for operating, for availing corporate finance, intra-group financing, uh, better liquidity management and risk management practices. Recently also, the central bank had issued a master direction as early as last month to revise the existing norms pertaining to classification, valuation, operations of investment portfolios and treasury operations of commercial banks. As per the new guidelines, uh, the treasury transactions undertaken by commercial banks shall be separately uh, subject to concurrent audit by internal auditors and result of these internal audits will be placed before the chief executive of the bank once every month. I'll now want to, uh, oh, you know, oh. discuss a few. Sorry. No, I, I I'll now want to exactly discuss. Exactly the point, you know, India being one of the most litigated jurisdictions, I was just about to what Yeah, I, I think in terms of litigation, um, you know, the intergroup and funding transactions have been the most litigated, uh, you know, one of the most lit litigious issues uh, in transfer pricing in India. And broadly, these issues have revolved around recharacterization of instruments or determination of the arm's length consideration. Let's talk about the recharacterization uh, aspects of, of, of this, uh, you know, from a litigation standpoint. Capital contribution provided by Indian headquartered entities to over, oversee group companies or subsidiaries for nil consideration or lower than fair market value has been one of the major areas of TP litigation for Indian outbound taxpayers. Transfer pricing authorities have completely disregarded contentions of the taxpayer to say that these contributions are shareholder support and have just completely disregarded that and treated as loan simpliciter. Alternatively, what has happened is valuation of equity shares issued to group companies has been challenged by tax authorities. They have contended that by virtue of undervaluation of shares, the intent taxpayer passed on benefits to their A's and, and they have characterized this as deemed loan. 
such deemed loans have been adjusted uh, to for interest that should have been received according to the tax authorities by the Indian entities. This controversy is fairly settled based on some landmark court decisions. The technical position is emanating from these rules is around, revolving around the non-applicability of TP provisions for such capital account transactions because there is absence of taxable income arising under the framework of the local laws. Tax authorities' action of recharacterization issue of equity shares as deemed loan is not justified and therefore non-jurisprudence. However, many taxpayers in the past have faced high-pitched lit TP litigation on this issue. With a similar approach, overdue and deferred receivables from AEs have been recharacterized as deemed loans, where the actual credit realization period exceeds the credit period as per the global policy or the agreements, TP authorities have treated such transactions as separate funding transactions necessitating a recovery of interest on such deferred receivables. Given this trend, some of the taxpayers have recently actually incorporated uh, you know, an arm's length interest receivable from AEs for overdue receivables to avoid potential TP exposures during audits on account of such delayed recoveries. TP authorities are also re resorting to recharacterization of inbound debt, considering them as equity and disallowing the interest paid on such debt. Regulations in India permit hybrid and convertible debt financing to attract FDI, CCDs, etc. With international technical guidance and commentaries relating to excessive interest, payment limitations and thin cap rules to prevent base erosion, Indian tax authorities have been very vigilant on payments made by taxpayers outside, uh, taxpayers for intra-group uh, loans received from their group companies overseas. Specially field officers for such uh, instruments have been recharacterizing these instruments as uh, debt, uh, debt instruments as equity and disallowing the interest payments. There is also significant uh, litigation from a comparability analysis perspective. Intergroup loans are benchmarked using CUP method, open market lending rates such as LIBOR or recent base, ma uh, base rates like SOFR, marginal cost of funds, interest rates as per ECB borrowings and spread as applicable. However, the key issue is the non-availability of data. It, because of lack of data and also combined with a lack of a knowledge by, of the tax authorities, there is significant litigation on this front. One of the other contentious issues of for funding transactions is the usage of interest rates prevailing in the Indian financial markets or the interest rate prevailing in the borrower's market. In some of the settled judicial proceedings, the interest rate depends on the currency in which the borrower repays the loans. Uh, the other uh, issues also revolve around comparability factors like uh, tenure of the of the of the loan, the geography of the lender, security, uh, sub subordination, etc. With a view to mitigate litigation, there have been safe harbor rules also prescribed uh, for intra-group loans. These loans, these uh, rules primarily prescribe an arm's length rate for interest for provision of intra-group services to A's and their separate uh, safe harbor rules for uh, loans denominated in INR as well as in foreign currency. However, it's important to note that the Indian safe harbor rules do not provide similar provisions for loans availed by Indian taxpayers from its A's. The Indian tax laws also contain some deeming, deeming provisions to tax uh, excess of the share premium over the fair market value or the arm's length price of shares. Earlier, these provisions were only applicable to resident shareholders. And an argument could be taken that transfer pricing is not applicable in, in absence of taxable income. However, recently in the Finance Act 2023, uh, the scope of this provision has been expanded to cover issue of shares to non-resident shareholders. The amendment impacts shares issued by Indian subsidiaries to their foreign parent at premiums, at, premi at premium rates in excess of the fair market value of the shares. And conse consequently, the argument that there is no income chargeable to tax in these transactions is no longer available, which is resulting in these uh, transactions also being covered under the T 
CP provisions of India. Given the general uh, evolving economic uh, landscape and the tax and transfer pricing landscape, the applicability of uh, GAAP provisions, Indian tax provisions have been uh, undergoing significant amendments to curb tax uh, tax base erosion on account of under and over evaluation of shares. This is thus it's become more imperative for taxpayers to examine such financial financing transactions from an arms length perspective to mitigate any high pitched audits and legal hassles in India. Um, we can now move on to uh, getting our inputs from our uh, colleagues in Japan. Um, thanks, Anushree. I think uh, Trina is having some connectivity issues. So maybe I'll just uh, quickly um, go through the, the, the slide of Japan. So. Um, similar to other jurisdictions, in 2022, Japan's National Tax Agency finalized amendments to the Commissioner's Directive on the Operation of Transfer Pricing Administrative Guidelines regarding financial transactions. As we can see, this amendment has aligned the directives largely with the OECD Chapter 10. There is a distinct focus on the application of CUP, lender's cost of fund, and other approaches which the OECD talks about. It will be interesting to observe how the Japanese m &E would adopt this. As with the new directive, it is likely expected to have more scrutiny by the Japanese tax authorities. Now let's talk a little bit about Southeast Asia. So before I discuss uh, about Malaysia and few other Southeast Asia countries, let me bring in Thep. Um, um, so Thep, yeah, can we hear your views in terms of adoption of Singapore uh, in terms of the Chapter 10 uh, guidelines on financial transactions? Thanks, Rashank. So the OECD released the transfer pricing guidance on financial transactions in the Chapter 10 of the 2020 edition of the transfer pricing guidelines. So this guidance in Chapter 10 was significant as it was the first time the OECD TP guidelines had included guidance on transfer pricing aspects of financial transactions. The inclusion of Chapter 10 was intended to help bring consistency in the application of transfer pricing principles to financial transactions and avoid transfer pricing disputes and double taxations. So Chapter 10 covered various transfer pricing aspects of financial transactions, including the accurate delineation of capital structure of borrowers and the pricing of certain common financial transactions, such as treasury functions, intergroup loans, cash pooling, and guarantees. In Singapore, following the release of Chapter 10, IRS released the sixth edition of the Singapore TP guidelines. One of the key updates from the previous version of the Singapore TP guidelines was the inclusion of additional guidance on related party financial transactions. As part of this guidance, the Singapore TP guidelines direct taxpayers to take guidance from Chapter 10 in analyzing and pricing the financial transaction. As such, the application of the arm's length principle to pricing related party financing in Singapore is consist is largely aligned with the approach set out in Chapter 10 of the OECD TP guidelines. So whilst there is no thin capitalization rules implemented in Singapore, since uh, the Singapore corporate tax rules contain provisions for the restrictions of the amount of interest expense and borrowing costs that can be claimed by taxpayers, the sixth edition of the Singapore TP guidelines nonetheless incorporates additional steps of requiring a qualitative analysis of the purported loans to determine if the financing should be regarded as a loan for tax purposes. The approach set out in the Singapore TB guidelines on the purported loan analysis requires an accurate delineation of the transaction. To assist, the guideline sets out a number of useful indicators to consider as part of the analysis, such as an obligation to pay interest and the presence or absence of repayment dates, which are consistent with the indicators in the OECD TB guidelines, as well as the IRS's e-tax guide on hybrid instruments. Back to you, Brasheng. Thanks. Uh, um, thanks, Tep. Um, actually, this was really good inputs. Uh, maybe just on this point on uh, adoption of uh, the Chapter 10 guidelines by IRAS, are you seeing any changes in terms of how IRAS approaches financial transactions in terms of their audits and, 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 and other processes? 
Ah, thanks for sharing. So historically, we've not seen IRS asks too many questions in relation to related party financial transactions. However, since the release of Chapter 10 and the sixth edition of the Singapore TP guidelines, we're starting to notice a greater number of queries from IRS on related party financial transactions, specifically around guarantee payments and intergroup financing transactions, especially in the real estate se sector. We expect this trend to continue going forward as RNRS to continue to raise more questions about related party financial transactions. So therefore emphasizing the need to maintain appropriate analysis and documentation of related party financial transactions. So I'll, I'll pass back to you now to discuss the recent developments in, in Malaysia. Um, thanks, Deb. Uh, thanks for the inputs on Singapore. So, um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'll be covering a couple of regulatory updates um, in Malaysia, which has a direct impact on the two key treasury transactions of guarantee fees and loans. And then I'll be covering a little bit on, on earning stripping rules or uh, the thin capitalization rules in some of the countries in Southeast Asia. So let's start with um, with this slide. So on the left, uh, what you could see is something around guarantee fee as a deductible expense. So historically in Malaysia, the tax authorities had a very clear position that the guarantee fees were never allowed as deductible expenses since these were treated as capital in nature and not revenue. This conclusion was arrived at on the basis that guarantee was not wholly and exclusively incurred in production of income for the taxpayer. Now, during August 2023, the APEX court in Malaysia in the matter of PNK ruled in favor of taxpayer that the guarantee fees paid by the taxpayer were specifically incurred for the purchase of certain products which are critical to the functioning of its business. And accordingly, it is wholly connected to the business and um, favored that the taxpayer uh, should claim it as deductible expense, despite the high court and other tax authorities ruling it against the taxpayer. Now, this judicial pronouncement is expected to have far reaching effect, especially from a transpricing perspective, as the arm's length nature of guarantee fee payments was not debated in the past, which would now gain significant traction. Moving to the second part, which is on the right side, uh, which has been introduced sometime in middle of 2022 is taxation of foreign sourced income, including interest income in respect of loans advanced by Malaysian company to an overseas borrower with funds utilized outside of Malaysia. Such income from a, for a Malaysian taxpayer was exempt in the past and it would now be taxable. Another important part is that this income would be taxable only when the income is remitted into Malaysia. In the pre-June 2022 era, a large portion of Malaysian headquartered companies used to <clears throat> large portion of uh, used to um, sorry foreign sourced uh, moving sorry a large portion of the Malaysian headquartered companies used to advance interest free loans to its overseas group companies. Since the income was not taxable and to avoid dispute on the expense deductibility from the borrower's perspective. Now with this new amendment on taxability, the foreign sourced interest income, it needs to be seen how tax authority treat the imputed interest since that can't be remitted and accordingly can't be brought to tax. Additionally, the Malaysian regulations has penalty or surcharge provisions, which is linked to the value of adjustment and not additional taxation which can be applied to this context. While there is no formal verdict because this judicial pronouncement is specific for, um, for that taxpayer, the taxpayer should keep this in perspective as that is something which is quite critical when deciding on treasury policies. And since this is really recent, which has only been announced in August 2023, um, we are still testing waters in terms of how taxpayers would treat the guarantees in terms of their, their tax returns and, and other aspects to it. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. And um, these are a couple of slides quickly covering on the earning stripping rules uh, in Malaysia and some other countries in Southeast Asia. So Malaysia introduced um, earning stripping rules few years back. Uh, it 
it is capped at 20% of tax EBITDA, so earnings before interest, tax and depreciation and amortization. Um, interest expense includes all type of interest expenses. There is a de minimis threshold of half a million ringgit, which is about 125,000 US dollars. So if you have interest expense below that, you are not exposed to um, ESR rules. A company which is which which is subjected to ESR is basically obviously companies which have payments uh, of interest to related parties outside of Malaysia. It could be uh, uh, payment of interest to permanent establishment of branches as well. Additionally, it also includes payment of interest to a third party outside of Malaysia, which is guaranteed by the group. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, the good part with the Malaysian regulation is that the interest expense, which is disallowed due to the cap, uh, can be uh, carried forward for the infinite period. So let's move on to the to the penultimate slide, uh, and 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 which has some coverage on some other Southeast Asia countries. So let's go to the first one, which is Indonesia. So Indonesia is one of the countries in the region which still officially adopts thin capitalization laws. Uh, it provides for a maximum debt to equity ratio of 4 is to 1. The regulation um, uh, also states that if the taxpayer has negative equity, then the interest expense is not allowable at all. However, in 2021, uh, the Indonesian tax law uh, enacted a regulation which gives the power to the finance ministry to adopt other measures uh, other than the thin capitalization measures to 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 minimize the interest cost which is there, which is more aligned with what OECD suggests. Yeah. And a couple of other jurisdictions, Philippines and Thailand, yes, there is nothing official in both these jurisdictions in terms of thin capitalization or earnings stripping rules. But both these regulations, both these jurisdictions do recommend uh, certain ways in terms of managing the interest expense which is there. For example, in Philippines, the TP audit guidelines specifies that the tax authority should consider a debt equity ratio to tax to test the taxpayers intra-group financing transactions and um, um, and Thailand also is something similar where it says that however certain capitalization thresholds may apply if the taxpayer is granted tax incentives by the board of investment so with this um, um we we've come to an end but there is um a question uh and, and let's move on to the questions part so um there's a question for anushri because it's a, it's a question for india so anushri can you maybe give a little bit of an update in terms of what's happening with the with the earnings stripping rules in india sure Rishang. so uh uh, historically, India didn't have any regulations, but in 2017, uh, thin cap rules were introduced in India. Essentially, uh, the thin cap rules have been restricted for interest payments up to 30% of EBITDA. And that is below a certain threshold. Uh, if your interest payments are below that threshold, then the restriction would not apply. Uh, there is also an exception that has been carved out for uh, banking uh, sector and insurance sector. Uh, and as recently as last year, this exception has also been extended to NBFCs. So yes, now uh, India does have thin cap rules applicable uh, for non-banking, non-finance, non-insurance and non-NBFC sector. Okay, great. Yeah. Anushri, thanks. Yeah. Maybe we have a time for a few more questions. So maybe I'll 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 move to Pris. And Pris, can you maybe comment a little bit in terms of uh, if you faced any issues with using bond curves to benchmark interest rates? Yeah, sure, Vrushang. Happy to take that question. Um, I think the use of uh bond curves and bonds generally perhaps has come under a little bit of scrutiny um, since the um, uh, case judgment on Singtel was released. I think um, there's certainly a lot more uh, pressure there are um, comparables out in the market that are as similar as possible to the intercompany loan in question and so potentially a little bit of a hierarchy around um, comparable uncontrolled uh, price methods and certainly the use of particular data within the cup method. I think ideally if there were intercompany 
loans that are very similar to the terms in question, um, that would certainly be a preferred uh, method. Um, secondly, if there were um, no loans that were available, perhaps there's a question around, you know, are those terms actually arm's length? But if it can be demonstrated that, you know, bonds do meet that comparability criteria, that certainly would be um, second best. And I think the use of uh, bond curves uh, in and of themselves um, is probably a question around um, the cost benefit analysis of a detailed transfer pricing exercise. And certainly the more, you um, uh, tax risk or the larger the loan is, there would be uh, more work and more um, evidence of comparable um, market data um, that's expected by the tax authorities, in my experience, Rusheng. Um, thanks, Pris. Okay, let's move to one more question, uh, which is around guarantee fees. So I'll, I'll probably take that up and then uh, I'll pass it to Anushri because we have some uh, history of cases in India with respect to this. So the question is, what is the difference between the letter of comfort versus a proper corporate guarantee fee and which is regarded as an international transaction globally? So, I mean, based on my dealings in Southeast Asia and previously India, um, a comfort letter is more like uh, just a letter uh, which is given by the holding company, uh, which is basically not suggesting that it's a proper corporate guarantees. It's, it's just a letter of comfort saying that the holding company is the shareholder and um, the borrower may have some uh, comfort in terms of giving the loan to a borrower within the group. Uh, opposed to that, guarantee fee is something which is, which is actually regarded as a contingent liability in the balance sheet of the taxpayer. And accordingly, um, it also impacts the credit rating of the entity which is giving the credit rating. And accordingly, it is it is quite important uh, that guarantee fee is something which is a transaction recognized internationally as an international transaction versus comfort letter, which is something uh, more like uh, uh, not a proper uh, international transaction. Uh, let me move to Anushri. Anushri, maybe you want to give some updates in terms of what's happening uh, in India or is there any precedence around this? Sure, Vrishang. So uh, this issue of uh, letter of comfort and guarantee has been litigative as usual in India. But like you mentioned, uh, tax authorities have recently started acknowledging that the letter of comfort is only a letter of support and does not entail any kind of liability or ownership being taken by the group company or the parent. And therefore, a letter of comfort related litigation has been on the, uh, you know, has been on the decline of late. In terms of guarantee transactions, a lot of litigation is around, uh, you know, not tax authorities not being able to differentiate between pure play corporate guarantees, vis-a-vis back-to-back guarantees, which are, you know, more prevalent in the banking sector, wherein really the Indian entity is not bearing any risk because they are doing a back-to-back -back hedging of that guarantee with their overseas entities. So that's uh, that's an area of uh, litigation which we have seen significantly in the past. To again reduce litigation on these guarantee transactions have been prescribed, but uh, payers have not ideally gone for those safe harbor regulations because of uh, you know the rates being significantly high. But uh, guarantee transactions continue to be litigative, though uh, letter of comfort related positions have more or less you know settled um, in the recent years. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Anushri. And that, that's good to know. Uh, okay. So in the interest of time, I'll probably pick up last question, which is, uh, which is asked by someone and which is actually really common in today's time as to uh, for the arm's length uh, dealings uh, or arm's length interest rate, are we able to make reference to an existing rate that an external bank is, is catering to an existing company or it or there is a benchmarking which is required so um, so there are a few things uh, one is every loan has its own facet so i can i can take this up into two parts every loan has its own uh, terms and conditions and facets to it so if a loan is given by one company uh, by one bank to a particular company the terms and conditions and the underlying interest rates and everything could differ so it cannot be used 
Uh, I believe the question was also asked in a context that uh, if there is a quotation from the bank, uh, can that be used as a reference rate for arm's length purposes? Um, this was an approach which was adopted by a lot of countries before, but um, OECD in the financial transactions guidance and even before, were very clear that uh, quotations are basically not actual transactions and accordingly quotations cannot be taken up as uh, as a transaction for comparability purposes. So I'll be happy to open up for a minute for some of my uh, other colleagues to add if they've seen something else in this regard. Again, uh, I completely agree, Vishang, from an India perspective, if it's only a quotation, then the acceptability of that is highly, uh, you know, highly could be challenged. If uh, there is a bank a rate card, which they can substantiate that that is something which has been used for third party transactions with details of any at least sample of those transactions undertaken at those rates, uh, that is something that can be leveraged. But if it's uh, if it's pure plain quotes where there is no visibility on actual transactions being com uh, consummated at on those rates, then uh, really those can be challenged. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Anushri for adding here. So, so with this we've come to an end. So that's unfortunate. That's unfortunately all the time that we've had uh, today. So Priscilla, um, Philip, Michael, Deb. Anushri and obviously Trina, uh, uh, thank you and special thanks to all those who were able to join us today. We would like to encourage you to fill out the short survey that will pop up on our screen uh, in a minute and tell us what you think about today's program. If you've joined us late, please note that this presentation will be archived for future viewing. If you feel others would benefit from this webcast, please share the webcast via the share, via share this icon and have them visit Debrief's website. We will respond to all the questions submitted during the webcast in a couple of weeks because um, there were close to 15 questions which came in. We couldn't take all of them. Also, if you have any other questions or comments later, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the speakers. Uh, the details are there in the second slide and we'll be more than happy to speak to you. And please don't forget to tune in to our next scheduled webcast from the Corporate Income Tax on 18th of October, which is tomorrow. Uh, on tax collection at source in India, the uh, the concentrum continues. At last, from all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in Deloitte's Asia-Pacific Tax Webcast today. Goodbye.